This is Rummy's Corner. Rummy's Corner. On November 18, 1989, undisputed world heavyweight champion Iron Mike Tyson was scheduled to defend his crown in Edmonton, Canada against challenger Donovan Razor Ruddick. At that point in time, Iron Mike was universally recognized as the baddest man on the planet. But the fight was postponed in late October because Tyson was suffering from a condition known as costochondritis and the fight was ultimately cancelled altogether. Instead, Tyson's next fight happened in February 1990 in Tokyo, Japan, in the bout that is famously remembered for being the biggest upset during the long rich history of professional boxing. Going in, that match was viewed as nothing more than a tune-up fight for Tyson in preparation for a big-time showdown against Evander Holyfield. But on that night, Douglas had other plans, and he put on a performance for the ages, overcoming adversity along the way, before scoring the dramatic 10th round knockout against the undisputed baddest man on the planet. It was epic, it was surreal, and it was a damn fine showing from Tokyo Douglas. But that magical storybook ending for Buster Douglas ended there, and he would go on to lose his very first championship defense when he was stopped by a Vander Real Deal Holyfield in round three in October 1990. By the end of that year, Tyson had rebounded from his lone defeat with a first round stoppage victory against Henry Tillman, which avenged his previous amateur losses against Tillman. And Tyson also went on to score another first round stoppage victory, this one against Alex Stewart. At that point in time, many viewed Tokyo Douglas's victory against Iron Mike as nothing more than a fluke. And even though Holyfield was the reigning, undisputed world heavyweight champion, many if not most observers still viewed Tyson as the best heavyweight competing at that time. Meanwhile, Donovan Razor Ruddick was on a 16-fight winning streak, which included victories over a trio of former heavyweight champions, including a decision win against Mike Weaver in 1986, a knockout victory against James Bonecrusher Smith in 1989, and perhaps his most impressive victory of the bunch, which was a brutal fourth round knockout against Michael Dokes in April 1990, which was less than two months after Tokyo Douglas had shocked the world. By the beginning of 1991, Evander Holyfield was still in possession of all three major titles of the time, the WBA, WBC, and IBF. Mike Tyson was universally rated as the number one contender by all three alphabet organizations, and Razor Ruddick was universally recognized as the number two ranked contender by all. This paved the way to a showdown between Tyson and Ruddick, where the winner of the elimination fight between the two top-ranked contenders was expected to challenge Holyfield for the undisputed crown. The date was March 18, 1991, and the atmosphere was electric. Tyson came out applying pressure, and Ruddick was swinging for the fences. Tyson landed a right, and a stumbling Ruddick tripped over his foot. Both boxers were looking to unload their firepower, and there was a lot of inside maneuvering as they tried getting the range situated. Things were intense, and both looked more than ready to rumble. Early in round two, Ruddick blocked a mighty left hook from Tyson, but the punch still dropped him anyway. Replays revealed that Ruddick had tripped over Tyson's foot. Ruddick beat the count and did not appear at all hurt. Action resumed, and the affair remained both scrappy and tactical, with Tyson landing the more damaging blows and with greater frequency. There was a lot of grappling where each guy was trying to create an opening for a free hand, and Tyson was generally finding more opportunities, particularly downstairs. This basic rhythm continued, where Ruddick was trying to smother Tyson in tight, and Tyson was studiously searching for a favorable position where he could pounce. Tyson remained sneaky when attacking the body, and Razor was having difficulty making things happen whenever the two were at mid or long range. Late in round three, Razor opened up and Mike nailed him with a catapult left that dropped Ruddick. He smiled as he made it to his feet and the round was over. 
Tyson remained methodical with his tactics and rhythm in round four, and Ruddick was not doing a whole lot on offense. Mike was throwing more, landing more, and landing better. Tyson continued making a solid investment clubbing to the body, and he was simply being more innovative with his approach. The two traded after the bell to end the fourth. Ruddick started throwing more the following round, as the action largely continued in the familiar pattern of a phone booth scrap. Ruddick was being a bit more adventurous on offense, but Tyson was still consistently landing better and more often. But Ruddick was absorbing it all. The pace slowed down over the final half of the fifth, and Razor had endured a good deal of punishment to that point. Both boxers seemed a bit rejuvenated at the start of round six, and they were both unloading with a lot of firepower whenever they threw. Tyson continued landing heavy leather throughout the ebb and flow, and Ruddick continued absorbing it well while searching for a big opening. Later in round six, Ruddick unloaded a fierce combination that definitely got Mike's attention. Mike took them well while remaining collected, and fireworks erupted to close out the round, where Ruddick got the best of the final battle heading into the halfway point of the scheduled 12-rounder. Both men looked a little taxed at the start of round 7, and most of the action reverted to prior form, with Tyson and Ruddick locked in close, each looking to discover a favorable angle to unload. In the midst of all this, Ruddick and Tyson were each landing some damn hard punches. Tyson then fired off a spirited mean combination that staggered Ruddick and sent him stumbling back into the ropes, and Richard Steele stepped in to wave off the contest. The fight was over, and it was a seventh round technical knockout for Iron Mike Tyson. Ruddick's corner did not care for the stoppage, and a bit of a scuffle ensued, which overshadowed the good sportsmanship on display from Tyson and Ruddick, and before long security restored order. But the nature of the stoppage itself was considered premature and a bit controversial, with Ruddick still on his feet after his best round of the fight. Despite being victorious, Tyson would not go on to challenge Holyfield for the undisputed heavyweight crown that once belonged to him. Instead, Tyson and Ruddick would have a return bout on June 28, 1991, and the atmosphere was once again electric. And once again, the winner of the rematch was expected to challenge Evander. Both boxers looked loose at the start, and before long Tyson and Ruddick were each looking for openings to unload their ferocious power. Once again, a bulk of the action was unfolding in close quarters, with a lot of in-tight positional maneuvering. It was almost like a continuation of where they left off in fight one, and Tyson landed a nice big right as the opening round was nearing the end, with both guys throwing after the bell when the opening round concluded. Tyson was being aggressive and effective early in round two, and Ruddick was trying to selectively fend him off. Referee Mills Lane gave Tyson a warning for venturing low, and just before the halfway point in the round, Tyson dropped Razor with a booming overhand right. Ruddick beat the count, and Tyson was ferocious with his follow-up. Somehow, Ruddick remained upright after being tagged with some really heavy leather, and Tyson was once again warned by Lane to keep him up. Ruddick survived the round without further incident. Tyson landed a big right early in round three, and Ruddick fired back with authority. Ruddick was beginning to find the mark with a snappy uppercut, and before long there was a lot of inside scrapping and maneuvering reminiscent of their first bout. Both boxers were hammering each other with hard shots, and overall it was a good bounce back round for Ruddick. Early in round four, Ruddick attempted another mighty uppercut, which Tyson dodged and countered with a masterful right that put Ruddick down for the second time. Ruddick beat the count and Tyson jumped on him, but Razor was able to withstand the onslaught and smother Mike in tight. Mills Lane called time so Ruddick could replace his mouthpiece, which bought him a valuable breather. When action resumed, hard punches were flying about, and both guys already looked rather fatigued at this early stage in the contest. The two once again traded after the bell sounded to end the round, and Mills Lane deducted a point from Tyson. 
The pace in round five slowed down considerably, but both boxers were still unloading some heavy punches to break up the longer lulls in inactivity. By and large, Tyson was in control at this stage, and he was throwing a lot of wicked two-punch combinations, including several good shots downstairs. Things picked up a little in round six, where Ruddick appeared to be landing the cleaner shots in the first half of the round, but Tyson came on stronger over the second half of the round. Round 7 got off to another slower start, but some heated exchanges unfolded as the round progressed, and this was becoming the story of the fight, where lulls in activity were being interrupted by raw firepower. But as the 7th drew towards its conclusion, Ruddick appeared to have a bit more bounce in his step as he finished the round strong. But in round 8, another somewhat sluggish round, it was Tyson who was looking fresher and throwing more against the lethargic looking Ruddick. Razor started fighting a little more near the end of the 8th, and even after the 8th ended, where this time Lane deducted a point from Ruddick for throwing after the bell. Tyson and Ruddick were a bit more active on offense in round 9, but the pace remained slow and steady. Mills Lane deducted another point from Tyson for throwing a low blow in the round. Ruddick landed some good shots to end the ninth, and then in round 10, Tyson seemed a bit rejuvenated, and he began targeting the ribs of Ruddick with some savage shots downstairs, which seemed to further drain Razor. But one of those body shots again strayed low, and once again Mills Lane deducted a point from Tyson for throwing a low blow. And this was the third point deduction from Tyson in the fight. Ruddick rallied back after that and he appeared to have Tyson buzzed, but Iron Mike hung in there and battled back. Mills Lane continued having a busy night, once again warning both fighters for throwing low in round 11. But at this point, Lane seemed reluctant to deduct any more points. It wound up being another scrappy round where each heavyweight was having spots of success, but Tyson seemed to be winning the mini battles more often than not. Both boxers were digging down deep in the 12th and final round, with each exhibiting a great deal of heart, toughness, and determination as they continued clubbing away and absorbing a lot of bludgeoning shots. The action concluded, true to form, with both boxers landing below the belt and exchanging after the final bell. It was a brutal and grueling encounter for both boxers over the 12 round duration, and with Ruddick being dropped in the second and again in the fourth, and also being deducted a point, and with Tyson having three points deducted in total, it provided for a bit of an unusual mathematical situation in terms of scoring a 12-round contest. When the verdict was announced, one judge scored it 113 to 109, and the other two judges had it 114 to 108, all in favor of Iron Mike Tyson, the winner by 12-round unanimous decision. In theory, this paved the way to a long-awaited showdown between Holyfield and Tyson. The date was set for November 8, 1991, but Tyson was forced to pull out of the fight because of a rib injury suffered in training. At the conclusion of 1991, Holyfield was the undefeated, undisputed world heavyweight champion, and Tyson was the universally ranked number one contender. The two were waiting on Tyson's criminal trial before rescheduling their postponed contest. But on March 26, 1992, former heavyweight champion Mike Tyson received a six-year prison sentence, which he began serving in April of that year. Tyson ultimately spent more than three years in prison, and during his time away, the heavyweight landscape changed dramatically. During his absence, in late 1992, a four-man tournament took place between the top four heavyweights, which included Razor Ruddick, Riddick Big Daddy Bo, Lennox Lewis, and undisputed world champion Evander Holyfield, who by that time had made three successful title defenses, the most recent coming against former longtime champion Larry Holmes, the Easton Assassin. Many observers favored Ruddick to be the last man standing in the tournament, in large part because of his strong efforts in his two losing performances against Tyson. 
Despite the fact that Tyson was in prison, many fans still viewed him as the best heavyweight on the planet, dismissing the Tokyo Douglas loss as a fluke. But in the first bout in the four-man tournament, Ruddick was blasted away and stopped in round two against Lennox Lewis. And two weeks later, Riddick Bowe became the new undisputed world heavyweight champion when he won a 12-round unanimous decision against Holyfield in an instant classic. But Bo and Lewis were unable to reach terms, and Bo ultimately vacated the WBC belt. After losing against Lewis, Ruddick was never again viewed as one of the elite heavyweights in the division. And by the time Tyson returned to action in late 1995, despite still having a reputation that exuded an aura of invincibility, he was no longer the same fighter he had been prior to going to prison, and was far removed from the fighter he had been when he was in peak form under the guidance of Kevin Rooney back in 1988. Despite that fact, Tyson did regain the WBC belt when he stopped Frank Bruno in their 1996 rematch, and Tyson also captured the WBA belt when he stopped Bruce Seldon a few months later. With Tyson and Holyfield having such a long history of failed would-be matchups, first when Tyson got upset against Tokyo Douglas, then again when Tyson's first victory against Ruddick was viewed as being controversial, then when Tyson suffered a rib injury in preparations for their scheduled November 1991 showdown, and then finally when Tyson went to prison, the two finally did meet in November 1996, when Holyfield defeated Tyson to win his WBA title, and Iron Mike would never win another championship for the rest of his career. At the end of the day, the rivalry between Iron Mike Tyson and Donovan Razor Ruddick was a memorable one, and it was a bit of a unique situation in the modern era where we had an elimination bout between the universally ranked number one and number two contenders, according to all three major alphabet bodies. That's not the type of thing we see in this day and age with the great abundance of alphabet soup. And not only did they battle it out in an elimination bout to earn the right to challenge the undisputed world champion, but they ran it back in an immediate rematch because of the debate surrounding the supposedly premature and controversial ending in their first encounter. But in a more modern context, the stoppage win for Tyson in Fight 1, when Richard Steele waved it off? I'm not sure that type of an encounter would necessarily demand a rematch today. For the most part, Tyson had been in complete control of the fight, dropping him twice and winning virtually every round, with the exception of round six where Ruddick had his best round. The fact remains, that was a title eliminator, and Tyson won the fight. Then again, the ebb and flow of their rematch had a similar feel, where Ruddick was again dropped twice during the early rounds, but this time he persevered and battled back and did so until the final bell. But if that Tyson-Ruddick rematch never came together, it makes you wonder what might have been, in terms of seeing Holyfield and Tyson battle it out back when they were both younger and fresher than they were in 1996. A lot of people understandably wonder what might have been had Tyson not suffered the rib injury for their scheduled bout in November 1991, but if Tyson and Ruddick never had their rematch, which no doubt took a toll on both Warriors, the idea of seeing Holyfield vs. Tyson in the summer of 1991 provides, to me, an even more captivating proposition. Heavyweight boxing as we know it may have unfolded much differently, but it didn't. Thank you very much for watching everyone. I hope you enjoyed and have a wonderful night. This is Rummy's Corner.